Hey everybody, Dylan Manfrey on hand, the sports editor of the Rider News. My co-editor Sean Schoenbrough and I had a candid one-on-one -on -one talk with men's basketball head coach Kevin Baggett on social justice and Black Lives Matter. We're going to be releasing our full interview in four 15-minute installments. Hope you enjoyed part one. On July 3rd, you made a statement. Um, I know you're not very active on social media, but um, take me through like the process of what you felt you were putting out that statement, you know, talking about the situations that are going on in the country. Yeah, so I, I'm always a person that I, I'm, first of all, was the, the whole situation just was very sad by the fact that somebody could kneel on someone's neck for that long, on George Floyd's neck. Um, but I, I'm always a person that I, I'm, I'm not a social media person, but it was something that impacted me and something that's been going on as I say, I've said a number of different occasions over the past 400 years, uh, just things like this, the police brutality, um, you know, the social biases, you know, the, any, the inequality. Uh, and, and so that it really struck me because when I'm a coach, not even the fact that I have a platform, but just the fact that um, enough was enough to see something like that. I mean, I've heard of it. I've read it. I've seen different situations. But to really, really see that and watch the entire video of it and, and just it, – it was just sad. So I thought about it for a while because, um, again, as I said, I'm not a social media guy uh, and, and I don't want to be picked apart by people and I don't want people to judge me, you know, at times for what my personal beliefs are. So I, I choose to stay away from social media, mm. but this particular situation wasn't even about me. It's just about being a black in America today and, and being a mentor, being a coach, being a father, being a husband, and just taking a stand that, uh, that this can't happen anymore. And it's continued to happen, but uh, that's what uh, drove me to put out the statement that I put on uh, social media. Had we not seen video of the officer kneeling on George Floyd's neck. Do you think there would have been as much outrage in this country as there has been now? I call it the perfect storm because we, we were in a COVID situation where people were really stricken to their homes. Um, and for this to come out at that time, I always believe in, I believe in a higher being in, in God. And I believe that God puts things out there for us all to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I think this was a time that it was all of this with the perfect storm, with the, co with the COVID going on, with this video being taken. And uh, it just gave America a chance to see really like what's been going on. I mean, these blacks have been hung for a long time, man. And these things haven't been caught on video. We've been drugged. Uh, by the back of cars, uh, we've been lynched. Um, and for these now, the, the fact that we have video, even what we saw back then in Rodney King when he was brutally beaten by the police officers, I mean, this, this has been over and over and over again. And then we've just seen the, the gentleman that just got shot in the back seven times. I, I don't understand it, man. I, I don't understand now that, uh, you know, people are protesting and rioting and all that's come about from George Floyd that we can continue to be in the same space and things continue to uh, happen the way that they're happening. Mm -hmm. And in the past few months, you, like you, you said, you're not a social media guy, but you've become very active and open about um, BLM and social justice. Were you like that, I guess, in the past, like when the country was up in arm or going through something with Trayvon Martin, were you as active as you were now? <sighs> No, I wasn't because those were – at that point, I thought they were isolated incidents. Um, but the more that it continued to happen, the more that it was like, wait a minute, th this is going on way, way too much. And, and, and any one time is too much. But the fact that it just continued to go on and on and on um, really prompted me to really get more involved and more active. Uh, and and I, I'm not an active socialist by no means, but – you know, I, I do 
it's impacted me. I have young kids. I've got a son that's 30 years old. I got a daughter that's 22 years old. And, you know, I'm concerned for their well-being going forward. And I, I've, I've been pulled over, you know, and, and anymore now you're so uncomfortable. And don't get me wrong, there's good police and there's a few bad police along the way. But, I mean, we're, we're all having anxieties now if you, do, if you get pulled over. And so I, I don't – I understand if, if you get pulled over for a particular reason, but there's, there's a due just – to this as well that uh that that process still needs to take place and i just think now i i, I don't think it's happening as much as it needs to be happening um can you detail i guess a time where you were you said you were pulled over was there any i guess racial bias sent your way in that encounter if you can comment on any of that um, I was I was pulled over one time and I knew I wasn't speeding. Uh, there wasn't any racial biases toward me, but it was I was uncomfortable and, and I knew the the officer was kind of picking at me a little bit. And I just said, "Would you mind if I record this?" And I think the minute that I had said that, I think he took a step back, um, asked me where I was headed, you know. Um, what I was doing out at 10 o'clock at night, which I'm going home, but I, I was leaving the office at that particular time. Um, I wouldn't say it was any racial biases, but you know, again, they were, they were telling me for whatever reason, I don't know. I know I was a swerving. I wasn't doing anything. I, I didn't, I had not drank anything and I, I don't do a lot of drinking and driving in the first place. Uh, but that was a time when I was uncomfortable and I had to ask if I could record it. And I think once I did that, I thought the officer kind of took a, a step down a little bit and just asked a couple of questions and took my license and um, registration and then came back and gave it to me and let me go on my way. Uh, but again, I was uncomfortable in that situation being that I knew I hadn't done anything, but, and I didn't react in any other way other than asking why I was being pulled over. And so, um, mm. I thought he was kind of trying to probe me a little bit, but at the end of the day, um, he let me go. Yeah. And you said you were coming home from I was um, Ryder? Yes. Yes. Wow. How far do you, how far do you live from Ryder? About 25 minutes. I live in uh, Burlington Township. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm about like 40, like just straight up route one in Metuchen. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I know it like, you know, it's not terrible. No. 25 uh, minutes isn't terrible either. No, I, I wanted to live – actually, it's my hometown where I grew up in. Really? Uh, when I came back to Ryder, uh, my wife and I decided to move back in our hometown. So nice. Good to be back at home. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm mm -hmm. sure. And uh – -huh. oh, sorry, Dylan, were you about to say something? No, go ahead, John. Um, you mentioned your kids and like their well-being going forward. What kind of conversations have you had with them about police behavior, social justice, all of the stuff that you're seeing in the world? Yeah, just, you know, we, we talk about when you get pulled over, make sure you keep both hands on the steering wheel until the officer uh, comes up to your window and, and that you, when they do ask for your, your license and your registration, that if it's in your bag or your pocketbook or in your glove compartment, that before you move your hands, that you ask if you can reach into your glove compartment or you ask if you can go into your pocketbook or your bag in order for you to provide them with whatever it is that they need. You know, I also talk about, you know, how you react to police officers as well. You know, don't, don't create a situation, you know, maybe because you got pulled over when you shouldn't have gotten pulled over. We, we discuss those things and, and just try and abide by whatever it is the officer is asking you to do um, without causing any kind of uh, conflicts are, are things that we talk about. We also talk about, you know, the, the inequality, of, you know, being black, you know, we, we have to work harder. I mean, I, I talk to my kids about when they apply for jobs, you know, a, a last name of Baggett or, or my son has my, my name and my daughter's name is Alexis. Um, there's, there's racial bias in reading, you know, resumes. I mean, if it sounds like a black person compared to a white person's resume, there's a chance that more often than not, our resumes won't be reviewed. We won't have opportunities to, to get those jobs. And, you know, we discuss all of that. We discuss the fact that, you know, 
how people look at us. So, you know, there, there have been times where mm-hmm. you got on an elevator to where somebody walks across the other side of the elevator because they're uncomfortable assuming that, you know, that we're going to do something. And there's been times where I've run at night and, and at, during the day and maybe I had a hood on. And, and, and now since Trayvon Martin, I'm a little fearful to be running with a hood on because somebody might perceive it a little different. And it's weird we, when we're going through this COVID now where we have on masks. Can you imagine just a year ago if somebody had a mask on and walked into a bank? I mean, everybody would be up in arms. So especially when a black person would have something on or a bandana or what have you. But those are all the the social biases that we deal with every day. And so, um, I, I you know, I, I talk to my kids about that. I, I, I talk to them about still at the end of the day, treating people the way that you want to be treated. And everybody's not going to everybody's not going to love us. I mean, you, you'll have, I have a lot of white friends and family and folks that have been good to me and good to my kids. And so there, there's, there's racial biases from black people, from white people, but I need our kids to understand that, you know, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We all want equality. We all want, we all want a life that's presented to us that we think we have opportunities and, and not be misled by the fact that at times we don't. Mm-hmm. What is, what's your biggest fear through all of this that's been going on? If, yeah. or just a fear, maybe not the biggest one, but what is a fear as a parent, as a coach, as just a black man, you know, what is your fear or one of your biggest fears? Yeah, so first and foremost, my biggest fear is the fact that, you know, all the protesting and everything that went on, the fact that white people have now taken a stance with us, a, a lot of white people. Uh, I don't want this to be a moment. I want it to be a movement. I don't want it to be something where a year from now, when we get, hopefully when we get beyond and past this virus, that uh, we forget all that's happened, that we continue to march and move forward, that we continue to make progress and that, that people really see the fact that, you know, there needs to be change. I mean, from the top to the bottom of, of, of our presidential to the White House, to the Congress, to the Senate, there, there need to be changes. And, and to me, the fearful part of it is that we've been talking about this for 400 years. I, I played a song um, that was from Marvin Gaye. Uh, it was... Mother, mother, there's too many of us dying. That was written back in the 1960s. And if you listen to that song, it was called What's Going On, right? If you listen to that song today, it's the same things that were going on back in the 60s as it is now. The police brutality, the, the, the water hosing, the dogs, the dog attacks being beaten by, you know, Blackjacks, Jack Stick, however, whatever they called them back in the day, those things to that we that we move forward. That that's my biggest fear. And then my fears for my family, my fears for my kids. Will they see a different world? That we've gotten better, we've taken steps. But will they see a drastic change? Mm-hmm. Because they're going to have kids, and I'm going to have grandkids. And for our players, I don't want to have a call. I don't ever want to get that call. I don't care, white, black, that, you know, our, our, that our guys were treated in a way to, or, or may have lost their lives or, you know, something to that effect that uh, should never have happened when things should be handled the right way by the police. And, again, I want everybody to understand that we always say this, until everybody understands that black lives matter, end of the day it's hard for us to, to sit here and say all lives matter because – our lives have not mattered for this long. And so until people understand that part of it, we, we understand that black lives matter, white lives matter, blue lives matter. But we need people to understand that our lives matter. I, I tell people all the time that if you remember the bombing in Boston, the Boston Marathon, right? You guys remember that? You remember the thing that happened in Las Vegas when the yeah. guy was shooting out the window? When you think about all that's going on in society in America – Black people always take a stance with white people and we support everything that goes on, right? That, as I just mentioned to you, those two different occasions. Uh, but this is an occasion where we need 
and it happened. We need white people to take a stance with us. And, and I thought that happened when you saw all the different countries that were coming together and, and saying that Black Lives Matter. That, that impacted me so big, man. It was such a good feeling to see that uh, people are, are coming to an understanding that, yes, Black Lives Matter, but all lives matter.